Welcome to the future, everybody. What is happening in your neck of the woods? Check it out. I'm rocking a new cap today. Let me know what you guys think of it. I'm not going to talk about the cap because we have important things to do. I need to introduce you to our guest today. And before I tell you who she is, I want to let you know a couple things I've learned about her. She is a learning designer and writer, and that makes perfect sense. But until today, I didn't even know what that term, I didn't know that term even existed. It sounds sexy. Learning designer, Matthew. <laughs> and she's worked with Pearson Education, Potbelly Sandwich Works, Starbucks, and Apple. Her mission is to democratize education while improving quality of online learning. She's calling us today from Chicago where it's 50 degrees and surprisingly sunny. And I want to introduce you to Janelle Allen who runs a company called Zen Courses and you can check out zencourses.co on the internet and we're going to talk about how to create an online learning course. And I met her recently because I was on her podcast, you guys. So what are we going to talk about today on this show? We're going to talk about why should you create a tiny product first. If you're interested in creating an online course, think small first. How do you differentiate yourself from all the offerings that are out there? Because it seems like everybody and their cousin is launching an online course right now, Matthew. Mm -hmm. When should you pre-sell your course? And how can you determine what to teach? That's a big question we get asked all the time. I don't know what to teach. I, do I have anything to offer the world? And I was diving a little deeper. I was jumping on LinkedIn, looked up the term learning designer. I found some things here. Look at this. I guess LinkedIn knows what a learning designer is because they figured out the median salary, which is $65,000 US a year. And it goes up, I think, according to this thing, as high as $90,000. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Top companies that are hiring Amazon, IBM, Accenture. So reputable companies. And here's another thing. This may not come to a, a, as a surprise to you, but in terms of the markets, top locations, United States and the United Kingdom, I guess, English speaking countries. Well, you guys, that's enough of me talking. Please help me welcome Janelle Allen. Janelle, welcome to the show. Yeah. All right. Now, I want to say this to everybody that's watching or listening. You also have an amazing podcast. And the reason why I invited you to the show, it's not often I get to talk to somebody who helps people like us. You teach teachers how to teach, right? Yeah, I do. Okay. Or experts, teachers, however you want to phrase it. Well, okay, amazing. So I'm going to just jump in and open it up with the question, what is a learning designer? Yeah, so that's a great start. Okay. Uh, it took my mom several years to be able to communicate what I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a learning designer, that is actually a new way to frame it. It used mm -hmm. to be called an instructional designer. I saw so that. Still for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it just means that I study how people learn, so using adult learning principles in order to create effective learning. So learning that's actually going to create transformation is going to achieve the objectives that it does. So that's essentially, there's two parts. There's design, so that's, you know, structuring the learning. And then there's development, which is when you get into e-learning. Mm. How do you study how people learn? That sounds so, fascinating to me. Yeah, it is. I mean, it started with a lot of psychology. Mm -hmm. So behavioral psychology, to be specific. Um, everybody is, well, I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of people are familiar with that experiment where you ring ring the bell and, and the dog comes running, right? Yeah, you know, that Pavlov. Pavlov, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So take that and then extrapolate it to people. What are the triggers that are, that are going to help us remember things? That's how it started. And then it evolved into uh, the military used it to figure out how to train. And then it's just continued to evolve over years to apply to e-learning and, and then academics and corporations are using it as well. So, yeah. This is fascinating because the only other experience I have with somebody who does some something similar to what you do or maybe the same thing is Dr. Holtzman and the few sessions that I've w worked with them and the workshops I've attended with them have blown my mind. So those of those people who are watching is like scratching their head thinking, mm, what is this all about? Okay, so when you say there are triggers to help people learn, is there some high level stuff that you can tell us like some things that you've observed and, and have found to be true about how people learn? Because I want to be a better teacher. Yeah, that's a big question. So okay, I'm sorry. the first, <laughs> that's okay. That's, I'm we just dive answer. into the deep end right away. <laughs> so there's first, I want to say there's there's some misinformation mm -hmm. uh, about how people learn. It's probably a, this is a great way to start things out. 
So a lot of people think about learning styles when you ask that question, how do people learn? Mm -hmm. And what has been proven is that learning styles are a myth. That's it's really about how you process information or how you prefer to process information. Okay. So what we know is that people remember things as a result of a, a few things. And it has to do a lot with it can be around constraints. It can be around modality. So, for example, I'll give some concrete examples. Changing a tire. You're going to learn how to change a tire. It's a very physical thing. You have to do it. And the way that you remember it is just doing it over and over and over, right? Yes. Then if I were to give you something like um, information that you had to remember for a test, for let's say math, for example, you're going to do the problems. But if I give you an English exam, then you're probably going to memorize those. If I gave you a vocabulary exam, you're going to memorize those terms. So what I'm getting at is there are what we call domains of learning, and it starts with memorization, which is at the beginning, and goes all the way up to synthesis, which is when you actually create and apply it. So there's different modes and different domains of how we go about remembering or learning how to do something. Mm. Well, the lower education, I say, I think K through 12, it seems to be a lot about memorization. Would you think that's an accurate statement, at least here in the U.S., as far as public schools go? That's a great question. I that's K through 12 is not my strong point. And mm -hmm. the education system in the US has changed a lot since I was in school. I think that now there is a lot of memorization. I know when I was going to school, my dad was in the military. So I went to school all over, but ultimately got here, there was a lot of application where there was rec recognition organization or recognizing that you had to play like you need downtime right you mm -hmm. need to turn your brain off and then sometimes you can come back and you can learn better so nowadays yes i think there's a lot of memorization but uh, hopefully we'll get back to a better time okay so you you mentioned a couple of key words here i'm looking at my notes you said constraints modality domains mm -hmm. of learning these are like big kind of heady words that you're using <laughs> right yeah yeah what yeah, do all are. those things mean i understand what constraints mean those are like yeah. limiting the parameters in which you learn in right is yes that constraints? so it is okay it is and every learner has constraints so picture it this way mm -hmm. a lot of times when you set out to teach something. If you're, if you're not a teacher, if you're not an instructional designer, you, the way that you usually approach it is you say, well, I have this information that I want to get out and I'm going to, this is what I think people should learn, right? That's usually how people approach it. But the reality is you have to approach it from the learner standpoint. And in the learner's world, there's a million and one things going on. Online courses is a great example. So you have to think about the environment that they're learning in. Are there a lot of distractions? You have to think about constraints can be environmental. They can be, uh, they ha could have a lot of family responsibilities. There's a lot of things that can interfere with learning happening. So that's what I mean by constraints. Oh, I see. Yeah. Like what's impacting their environment while they're trying to learn what it is that you're teaching them? Exactly. It can be it can be technological. So if I'm delivering, for example, I had a great experience today. So someone in one of my self-paced courses, mm -hmm. he couldn't access the Google, the Google Doc worksheet. He was confused about the technology. That's a constraint. So right. So that's something that I have to think about and make that easier for him next time. OK, that makes sense. Let's talk about modality. Yeah. So what that's that just. Mean? how you're situated. So are you learning, um, are, is, are you audio? So if, if I'm driving in my car, I'm listening to things, I'm learning things, mm -hmm. you know, I'm listening to it versus if I'm sitting down in my office and I'm learning at the computer, that's a different modality. So it's just, you know, the situation in which is probably the best way to think about it, the situation in which you're learning. Okay, situation, yeah. that makes sense, okay. So is the highest form in terms of domain of learning synthesis? Yes. That's like when you actually incorporate what it is that you've learned and you're acting on that now. Yeah, yeah. Synthesis is just putting it all together. So it is, you know, we talked about this in the form of mastery, right? Mm -hmm. When we had our, our interview. So 
you start with maybe memorizing things like words are a great example. I might memorize a word, but I don't truly know that word and I haven't truly learned it until I'm able to use that word just either randomly or, you know, if I'm writing something, that synthesis, being able to take everything that you've done and now you've got it and you can you can create or you can apply that into a context. Mm, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So you're talking about all these kinds of things in terms of behavioral psychology. I have to ask, what is your educational background? Yeah. So I have a master's degree in instructional technology Ooh. from Georgia State University. Mm -hmm. um, I have an, a bachelor's degree in creative writing um, with a minor in French and African-American studies. So that's my educational background. So is this something that you knew you wanted to do when you were going to school? <laughs> it sounds like no. it is. No, <laughs> it wasn't. Not at all. Like so for my undergrad degree, I like I said, I went to school. I was in creative writing was my major. Um, I started out just really interested in the arts, but I changed my major five different times. And I had no idea that something like this even existed. But what I found is that whenever I had to work all through school, I was always gravitating towards training. You know, even when I think back to my first job when I was 15, I was always put in a position to train. I was just good at it and I liked training. And gradually, Starbucks was my first experience where I was designated as a learning coach. And then at Apple, I did training with computers. And that's how I came to this. I see. Mm. You know, you mentioned something before. I, if I heard you correctly, uh, you, you're like, uh, your, your dad is in the military? He was, yeah. Okay, yeah, so course. he moved around. I've always been fascinated by the military because I was thinking they can take just about any human being and turn them into this elite fighting machine. And That's so they're doing something right. I mean, there's there's a lot. Of, okay, I'm, I'm I'm probably mischaracterizing. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody in the armed services. But uh, if you if you enlist into the into the army, they will physically change you. They'll mentally change you. They'll teach you discipline, self respect, honor, duty, and all that kind of stuff. And then you can do a lot of things. So I think if if any institution has figured this out on how to train people, I, I think the military has done it really well. Is that yeah. is that okay for me to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why the foundations of instructional design, it can be traced back to the military. They mm -hmm. were the first to start to put this stuff into action. Like, how do we actually train people? How do we get people to get the results, to achieve the results that we want them to? Mm -hmm. So how far back can we trace instructional design to the military? What, what year are we talking about here? Around World 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 War One. OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. Wow. So it goes back. Yeah, and it does. So what has the like what has the military figured out that we could probably borrow concepts from? Because I aspire to be a better instructor. What are they doing? That's a great question. Honestly, you know, I, I haven't kept up with what the military is doing, mm -hmm. but I think one of the things that, that the military is really good at is instilling uh, attitude, yes, habits, and being very clear on their program. You know, a lot of times course creators may or may not spend a lot of time researching and and designing their yeah. program. I think the military is great at investing in that research and and designing a program and being very clear on the intentions of the program. Mm -hmm. I just want to also instruct everybody that is watching this on our live stream on YouTube that Matthew will be reading your comments and questions. So if you have a question as it relates to the topic we're talking about today, that's Matthew. Thanks for thanks to Jonah for pointing out who I Matthew is. Well. Yeah, in case you weren't sure, one's Jonah, one's Matthew. He'll be reading that. So Matthew, anytime you think there's a good question, let me know. Just interrupt us, okay? Yeah. Okay. And I think we need to kind of dive a little deeper. So as we promised everybody, today we're going to talk about how to create and launch an online learning course. So can you give us some of the big ideas? Yeah. So we were chatting before. This is this is a big question. Mm -hmm. And honestly, my answer to this question when I first started doing this work with academic institutions has has changed dramatically. So the very first thing that you need to do if you're an entrepreneur or mm -hmm. a creative and you want to create a course is to start with your audience. You need to have a clear picture of what your audience, who your target audience is for your course and what 
result they want. So mm -hmm. that's the very first thing. So assuming that you have that information, assuming that you validated your course, then the next thing that you would do is define the goal for your course. So in other words, what is it that your learner should be able to achieve upon completion of your course? Mm. And then working backwards to outline your content. And in my opinion, once you have a, an outline, a solid outline, then you get into pre-selling, which I know was one of your, yes, your yes. questions mm -hmm. there. Yeah, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. Okay. I'm taking but, notes here as we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so those are the, like some big phases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so of the five stages that you outlined, uh, you said start with the audience, validate the course, define the goal, and what, well, I guess this is part of that, which is what should they achieve upon completion? Of course, what should they be able to do? And then yeah. working backwards to create an outline, where do most instructor, instructors get caught up? Like, where does it get messed up in this four or five step process? Yeah, another great question. So I would say it's divided into two segments. Mm -hmm. For a lot of new course creators who don't have an audience, they get stuck at the beginning. They want to create a course, but they aren't clear on who they're creating for. And if, you, if you're not clear with that, then you won't know what to put in the course and you won't have anyone to sell it to. So that's where a lot of people get caught up. The other segment would be people who do have an audience, they get stuck with actually just doing the work. You know, it sounds simple, but we all know that, again, constraints, we get busy, we procrastinate. So they get stuck with outlining and then trans transitioning to selling, outlining and selling their course. They just kind of get stuck in analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. And they also per just procrastinate uh, and just never get a finished product out. Why do you think they procrastinate? Because it's a big, it is a big venture, you know? So one of, one of my, I don't want to say one of my frustrations mm -hmm. is that I feel that uh, there are a, a lot of quote unquote gurus out there who make it seem that it's super easy yeah. to create an online course, but it actually takes some time, you know, on average, it can take you three months, two to three months, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's if you're really on top of things, you know, from start to finish. So I think that's why they get stuck because a lot of people spread this information that is, oh yeah, you can create a course in a couple of weeks and boom, you're going to sell it. You're going to have passive income. You're going to be on the beach. Right. And, Making six figures. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just doesn't work like wait, that. Wait, tell me the dream, Janelle. Don't <laughs> pop that bubble for me right now. What are you doing? Look, that's who I am. I am a truth teller. So yes, you are. Yeah. It's um, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to apply effort over, you know, a couple of months at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matthew, do you have a question for Janelle? Just yourself or uh, on behalf of our audience? Yeah, I think uh, since we were just talking about it, it's mostly about the audience. So yeah. if you don't have an audience, is there still a way to get the butts in the seat uh, in order to pre-sell your course? Uh, I understand that it's a two-part question, right? Part of it is understanding an audience and then the other part is gaining an audience who might want to take your course. What I'm asking is, how do you get the audience to want to take your course? That's the second part. Good one, Matthew. Yeah, that is a good question. So we'll assume that you are really tuned in to your target audience. So you get, but you just don't have an audience yet. So my answer to that question is there's a couple of things you can do. There's actually a few, but you can leverage other people's audiences. So you can partner with people and do joint webinars. You can do promotions. You can use Facebook ads. There's a lot of different things that you can do to lead people to your course if you don't have an audience of your own. Mm -hmm. So could you give us some examples? Because I love both of those, right? Advertising makes perfect sense. And the other mm -hmm. one is uh, leveraging other people's audience. Do you have an example of uh, one thing that you've done or maybe somebody that you've coached where they've had a very small or little audience and they've used this technique very successfully? Yeah, and that actually makes me remember the third thing you can do, which is going to tie into my example. So if you, and if you are a designer, freelancer, consultant, one of the best things you can do is to reach out to existing clients or maybe people who got in touch who maybe your services were out of reach for them and pitch your course to them. So one of, uh, one of the students in my group program, he is a web designer and he had a wait list of people who 
kind of a wait list, but also people who had just reached out, but maybe weren't in the position to hire him. So he started talking to them about whether or not they'd be interested in a course that would be more DIY and that he would guide them through the curriculum. And he pre-sold. He went through the program. We weren't even finished. And he pre-sold his, you know, the first seat in his course. So that's another thing that I feel like a lot of people neglect. Uh, services, if you provide services, which I always recommend people start with services, mm-hmm. not go straight to a course, you can reach out to your client base and that it can be a great way. Gotcha. So the idea there is if you provide some kind of service, you're just looking for ways to see if an audience is there if you were to productize that, right? If you were to systemize that or productize that in a way that uh, somebody else could pick up either DIY for themselves or you know go through and learn the process. Yeah, yeah. And I think you just said the key word, which is process. So Mm -hmm. consultants are a great example of this. Freelancers are a great example of this. If you have expertise in an area, chances are you have put a lot of thought into how to do something. And once you have a process, then you can package that process into a course. It's, It's just a fantastic way to go about it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I'm jumping in here. That's why I talk to you guys so much about having a process. Once you have it, you can do the work and then you can sell it. You can package it up. I want to use this opportunity to talk about Monday. I'm going to talk yep. about money because if you've been following us, we've been talking a lot about providing pricing options for your client. If you're reading Pricing Creativ- Creativity by Blair Enns, he says you should provide three price options. Three is better than two and two is better than one. So let's start with two. You have a bespoke high touch option, which is custom design. It's going to take a long time. It's going to cost the most amount of money. That's what you do currently. If you were to take that and make it into a DIY solution, that could be a tenth of the cost. So here's what's interesting. So let's just say you design a logo or identity system for $10,000. That's your high price option now. Right now, you have no other option. So without context, your clients have a difficult time figuring out, is that expensive? Is it affordable? We don't know. Then you give them the DIY option, which is your course on how to design identity systems. Mm -hmm. And that could be, uh, if one's $10,000, maybe that's $250. So it's really inexpensive, but it says that you have to do the work. So if you want me to do the work, fantastic, I'll do it. It's 10K. But here's a really low price option. So now it seems like, oh, I, I'm starting to understand this now. And if you get into more complex pricing strategies, we're going to talk about how to do decoys and things like that. Right, Matthew? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that, so that, uh, yeah, that, so yeah. this is perfect. I love this because mm-hmm. a lot of people in the creative service space don't know how to provide multiple options. They just think there's only one option, which is hire me. I would do the work and it'll be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is good news for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to create a graphic on this. So you guys keep talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I, I love that. And uh, we talk about it a lot here, obviously, because we create a lot of courses and content on our end. Mm-hmm. But what it sounds like is that once you have identified your process, right, and it, that takes a little bit of reflection and looking at the steps that you take, the goal, and I, this is how we do it, and maybe you can give us some insight, Janelle, is we try to create a recipe, essentially, Right. Mm -hmm. Just like any recipe in a cookbook, you see the end goal, what the dish is supposed to look like. You see how long the prep time is going to be and then all the necessary steps and ingredients to get to that end result. So we we look at our courses in the same way. What do we want the person to accomplish and what are the steps that we're going to take to help them get to achieve that thing that we promised them? Yep. Yeah, that what you just described is in my world is backwards design. So Mm. there's a a very, (laughs) a very dry but informative book called Understanding by Design. Mm -hmm. And it it really way to sell it. (laughs) (laughs) It was in my Amazon cart. And then I'm like, never mind. (laughs) I'm keeping it real. No, it's it's, it's on my it's actually on my desk right now. But that it it basically broke backwards design, which is Mm. that process of working from the goal and then working backwards, as opposed to just thinking, being in your own head and thinking, what, what should I put? What do I want to teach next? What, you know, but just having a more structured design for your course. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm going to jump into the next question here. Let me see. I've lost my deck. Where's my deck? Okay. I was busy taking too many notes. So we asked that question. Um, hmm. 
I, I think you talked on your on, or you you wrote in your on your blog about questions that you can ask in terms of how to figure out who your audience is, and you said something about you got to become a little bit of a detective, a sleuth, maybe <laughs> even a spy. Not literally, like don't put spyware on their software, yeah, no. or but you you talk about like what problems do they share, what language do they use, mm. what solutions have they tried? Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, sure. So. You know, the common thread here is mm. it's not about you. It's not about us. It's about what? who you're trying to. <laughs> I know, right? Shocker. Feelings are hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to figure out what problems your audience is seeking to solve. Mm -hmm. And yes, to do that, if you, if you have an audience already there, you can survey them. You can do customer development interviews, which is, you know, just getting one on one time and asking them, you know, what what problems they're having with their work. If you don't have an audience, then you can leverage tools like Facebook groups and also online forums, membership sites, anywhere your target audience hangs out, go there and find out what they're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. what are they sharing? What are they, cons what common patterns are coming up over and over where they're saying, I I'm running into this issue. Right. So, yeah, that's problems. And then you also, for the language, you want to capture the actual words they're using because one of the things that we do as humans is we filter and, and we, we kind of put our own spin on things. But if you really want to connect with your audience, then use their words in your marketing. It's just going to be mm, super helpful. Mm -hmm. It's going to Good make tip. You connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Use so, their words. This is the old Tony Robbins match and mirror thing. If they speak fast, you speak fast. If they use complicated language like constraints, modality, and domain of <laughs> learning, you got to use that. I can see the the group of people you've been hanging around with. Matthew and I, we hang with the riffraff by the art uh, area, and you're like, well, let's talk to the master's people who study design and <laughs> teaching and behavioral psychology. Yeah, I mean, look, I DJ as well. So when I'm hanging out with my DJ friends, I'm not talking about modality or domain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. All right, let's see what other kind of questions we have. Matthew, is there anything coming in and off the uh, our YouTube channel from our audience? Yeah, there, there's definitely some some uh, questions here, and I just don't want to bounce all over. They're okay. all they're all good. I just I want to make sure we're kind of doing this in order. So we're talking about uh, the audience, right, and right. understanding them, speaking their language. I think uh, this is something that we read out of the Russell Brunson book, which is really just trying to figure out where people congregate. Right. And uh, try and understand what do they care about? What do they what, what are some of the things that they talk about day to day so that you might plug yourself in and understand what those communities are about? So can I ask then, how would you identify the problem to solve? Like if I'm if I'm trying to f serve a particular community, how might I identify what uh, a problem that's big enough or valuable enough to solve? Right. Because there could be little ones and there could be big ones. And I know we might be chatting about this later. How do we identify those problems? Yeah, that's another great question. I love it. So you're right. There's a lot of things you're going to discover when you start. So basically, you're taking inventory. Mm -hmm. And what I recommend people do is to just write it down. Don't try to filter it. Don't try to put it in your own words. Initially, write it all down. And you're going to get problems that fall into two categories. You're going to get low value problems and you're going to get high value or what I call expensive problems. So the lower value problems are problems that you can still solve, but Maybe if you if you have an online presence that becomes uh, an article or a podcast episode mm. or a lead magnet. So something that you give away for people to subscribe. The higher value problems, the ones where people are talking about, people are referencing solutions they've tried. In other words, you can tell that they've spent money to solve that. Mm. That's how you discover those. Um, also, high value problems tend to affect people either it's costing them a lot of money, which is why I call them expensive problems. So it's costing them a lot of time or money dealing with this. So, for example, if I host online events and I'm having a hard time figuring out how to accept money for my events, I'm going to I need to solve that problem. Right. I'm going to be looking for someone. Mm -hmm. So. That's how you recognize it. If it's going to cost people money and if they are just really this is impeding their business, that's mm -hmm. a high value problem. Mm. That's fantastic. 
Um, so then if we were to put this in more concrete terms so that we have examples earlier, you just mentioned that uh, you DJ and you hang out with DJs. What yeah. are examples of low value problems that you see in that community versus a high value problem that we could solve for the DJ community? Matt also was a DJ at one point too. So he's like, yeah, oh, okay. I, got, I got my technique set up in the <laughs> other room case. right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Let me see. Okay. So a low value problem would, yeah, I'm looking at my headphones right now. I'm looking at my <laughs> um, yeah. A low value problem might be, okay. My headphones broke, you know, that's, that's a low, low value problem. I'm, I'm probably going to borrow some or eventually I'll get some, but I'm not going to go crazy about, you know, my headphones. Mm -hmm. A high value problem is I'm not getting booked. Mm -hmm. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have. So for me, I went to a, a DJ Academy here in Chicago and it ended up costing about three thousand dollars to like be taught by DJs here in Chicago how to DJ. So I want to get booked so I can, you know, get a return on my investment. So if I'm not getting booked, then that's a high value problem. I need to learn how to market. I need to learn how to get gigs. All of that. Those are high value problems mm. in the DJ community. I have a bigger high value high value problem for the DJ community. How what do you, you go from being a DJ in a club to being DJ Khalid? <laughs> Production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, producers. Right. That's kind of like a different thing. I know that's the same title, but it's it's a different. It's totally thing, different. Right? So they're just using the same word DJ, and it's just not. Right. Because like if you I mean, he DJs. Yeah, he DJs. But I think I, if we're looking at that value ladder or how big a person can get, right? There's the guys who do the the one-offs like the parties, then they'll do the clubs, right? And then you have residency where you're a permanent staple there and you you're there every week so you're getting consistent. And, and then you know what's what's up from there? Like maybe you start producing, maybe you start making your own content, maybe you start uh uh competing in like DMC or some of these big yeah. uh, world competitions cool. and then you keep going higher and higher until you're producing the music like DJ Khaled and then you're earning while you're sleeping or earning while you're uh, you know working on yeah. other things there's so many levels to the DJ game <laughs> I don't know if we want to open this. No, we don't. Or, Matthew just right. took us down a deep rabbit hole. I'm like, no. oh my God, no, residency. No. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just I just wanted to make some concrete mm -hmm. um, examples because I for for people who are watching, I just want them to understand what that might look like. Um, and then Chris, I don't know if maybe you want to jump in since uh, we have a lot of designers and creatives on here. What a low value problem is that we've solved versus a high value problem oh, that dang it matthew now you're gonna put me i want to put you on the spot holy cow i, I feel Wait, like people want add one more thing? oh go ahead so actually what you said about dj khaled is is a high value problem so there are a lot of djs out here who are just living gig to gig mm -hmm. and they want they love djing but they can't figure out how to make it a career and how to feed themselves mm -hmm. and their families mm -hmm. production is a fast path a fast track to doing that if you produce for the right people so that is a high value problem mm, i love that okay and matthew <laughs> just was flexing his dj knowledge on us and it's like all right all right matthew you know it's like i was just looking at two turntables i get it okay so from a design point of view a low value problem is how do i learn how to use illustrator or photoshop mm -hmm. just like teach me the technical stuff Right. That's mm -hmm. what designers are struggling with uh, or some of them. And then somewhere in the middle would be teach me the fundamentals of design. Like I know how to use the tools, but what makes for a good logo? What makes for a good layout? High level problem would be how do I solve a business problem using design? Mm. So and, and the design is in service of solving something much bigger than than an aesthetic problem. Did I do OK yeah. on that, Matthew? No, I'm sweating that, bullets that, over that, here. That's great. I, I think okay. that's a very clear ladder going up and, and stuff that we've solved, right? So on our mm -hmm. lowest end, our free content is how to use the tools, right? And then the second part is uh, our, our uh, more uh, affordable courses, which is like logo design and, and uh, the typography course. And then on the high end, we have our business bootcamp, which is trying to teach business owners how to solve bigger problems and how to close more clients. So, right. Okay. There we cool. go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted to ask this question. Um, I think it was Angel um, Velasquez who, who, who said, okay, I'm interested. I want to start making a course, but can you share with us some mistakes to avoid? Definitely don't do this when you launch a course. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> I'm taking notes. Hold on. I'm switching. All right, go ahead. I'm going to speak on it from a few different segments. Mm -hmm. So if you are just starting out and you don't have an audience, definitely don't jump right into creating a course for the first time. Like 
create a service first. So that's the very first thing I'm going to say. Okay. The, the reason is because if you provide services, you're going to learn so much about your audience. You're going to perfect and doc- document your process. And when you create a course, you will, you will not only have a client base and an audience, but you'll also be able to package what you know. So for people starting out without an audience, mm-hmm. that's my first That's excellent advice, by the way. I like that. I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Keep going. <laughs> For, for the next group, I'm just using my audience as an example, which mm-hmm. are my next segment are consultants, freelancers. So my advice for or things that they definitely don't want to do is just don't get stuck in perfectionism. Don't get stuck mm. in feeling that you have to create your entire course before you can mm-hmm. make an offer. So what I tell people is connect with your audience, find out what they want outline your course and then pre-sell it that is the biggest the you asked me earlier what holds people back and it's perfectionism mm-hmm. is, is a huge thing i'm just feeling like i have to create this thing and it has to be perfect before i can tell anybody about it no don't don't believe that mm-hmm. so that's the thing for them for for me ceos uh small teams who have courses or have a, an education platform mm-hmm. the biggest pitfall that they can avoid is not trying to do everything themselves. So what I see a lot of times are CEOs get in the weeds with content development, but they have a million other things going on. And so, you know, as CEOs, we have a hard time. We have control issues. Let's just be honest about it. Hold on. I have control Uh, issues right now. Hold on. For some reason, (laughs) your audio, your mic level is riding up and down, right? Jonah, you hearing that? Yeah, I'm hearing it. What's going on? Is there uh, something I'm not going doing on? Anything, you know? We're not doing anything on our end. For some reason, Janelle, it seems like your your audio is getting louder and quieter as you talk. I don't know why. Do anything on my end? It's, can you hear me now? We can hear we can you the hear whole you, time. It's just it's sometimes like, you're really loud and sometimes you're a lot quieter. For, it, it could be just the Zoom setting. Zoom in auto balances audio. Oh, can you turn off the auto balance on Zoom? Are we doing that on our end or her end? I don't know. We can- it, it's probably on her end. Okay, so let's just take a minute, go into the Zoom preferences and change your audio settings. And okay, audio. while you do that, I can show, no, I don't want to show anybody anything. Well. Yeah, it's like okay. if you go to your mic on the bottom yeah. and then you go audio settings. You guys hang in there with us. Then you I'll, I'll read yeah. the comments, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's something else here. All right, I'm in audio. Are you, okay. And what am I looking for? Okay, automatically adjust microphone. There yes. we go. So if you turn that off then we can manage it on our end. Yeah, I think what's happening is when you lean in and you speak louder, it's like going to pull it back. And then all of a sudden you rock your head back and then now it's too quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good. It's off. All right. Perfect. Excellent. Cool. Uh, So I was talking about small teams and things that they can, pitfalls that they can avoid. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things, what I was referencing is CEOs oftentimes want to be involved with, with all of the aspects and that can be a double-edged sword because CEOs have the expertise. I just went through this with a client. They have the expertise, but not often do they have the time or the ability to step back and just see things from the learner perspective. So I would say the best thing that small teams can do is to really invest in either learning about instructional design and taking the time out to, to design their course and have the strategy or to collaborate with someone who can provide that external perspective because small teams just have a lot going on and don't always have uh, all of the people to fill the seats that they need. Mm -hmm. And while you're talking about this, uh, I just want to ask, because I know you, you offer a course and if I'm really excited about this right now, I feel like I have an audience, I have my outline ready to go and I don't want to make a lot of mistakes and I do have these dreams of launching a course and being successful and creating passive income. Yeah. Uh, how, what is your course? How much does it cost? So I have I have a few offers. Mm-hmm. So I just launched a course for people who are looking to build their audience or learn more about their audience called mm-hmm. Audience Decoded. Mm-hmm. Um, that course is currently one forty nine. It's going okay. up in twenty nineteen. Um, <laughs> I also have a group program called Finish Your Damn Course, and <laughs> that I love is it. targeted. <laughs> That's targeted to the consultants and freelancers who have a process, but have just been stuck in, you know, one, doing client work and two, 
just thinking about how perfect they can make things. So it's my job is to guide them to actually finish. And that is currently 1497. 1497. And that's a coaching group? Yeah, it is. It's in beta right now. So it is, I'm actually going to keep it in beta for another six months. I'm going to open it up to another cohort um, in January, February. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Okay. So that's roughly $1,500, right? Yep. 1497. Okay. I got to say, I love the title of that because I, I <laughs> understand the, uh, the uh, selling proposition right away. Finish your damn course. Like I get that. That speaks to me because I have a bunch in the queue that I haven't yeah. gotten to because of my day to day. So when I hear that, I know who that's speaking to. And that's me, somebody who's already primed and ready that just needs to take action and needs kind of help or a community around that to, to, to push me forward. That's the voice yep. Matthew hears inside his head as he's like hitting heavy back at the gym. He's like, finish it. Finish, finish that, your course. course. <laughs> I could see that, Matthew. I guess that's the reason why you've been talking or one of your ideas is, is you should create a tiny product first because the bigger the product, the longer it's going to take, the more perfect it has to be. And yeah. it's making a big gamble that this thing's going to work, right? You want to create something, launch it, get it out there, validate it, and then you can build on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had to learn that the hard way, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, I came from creating courses for colleges and universities, you Mm -hmm. know, I was working with Pearson education and and that's what I was doing. And so when I decided to pivot, I was still in that mode of, okay, we're just going to build this whole thing when I launch it. But it was like, oh, it doesn't actually work that way for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What is better is to, you need to validate because you've got to figure out how to market and sell and you've got to figure out if people actually will pay money for this. So what better way to do that than to launch something smaller in scope to test the waters and then continue on and and build your course? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people that we've talked to or things I've read online talk about people who win the game the game, play it for the longest possible amount of time. I think Seth Godin talked about this. Rather than take $10,000 in time and materials and make one thing, do 10 $1,000 things and see which one works and then double down on that. Yeah. Right? And I you can play the game longer. Business. business is always about seeing what works, solving mm-hmm. problems, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. So next question I have for you is when should you pre-sell your course and what does that even mean? Yeah. So we'll start with the definition. Pre-selling okay. simply means validating to see if people will buy your course before you create it. That's mm-hmm. all it means. You haven't you haven't invested time in creating any content other than maybe an outline. And so that's what pre-selling is. The value of pre-selling is just that time. It saves you time and frustration if you were to create something and crickets, you know, nobody buys it. Right. So that is the, that is the what and, and the why which mm. is pre-sell. Well, there's an ex- excellent example of that out in the market right now. It's called Kickstarter, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you're pre-launching, yeah. you're talking about it as if you have it, but you don't. And it could take eight to a gazillion months before you actually release it. And you find out right away. And this is the fantastic part of living in the time that we do right now is that you don't have to go through expensive focus groups. You don't have to pay for all these kind of things to be built prototypes. You can pr- create a pretty cool video and just uh, have all vaporware and like nothing exists. It's all mock-ups and present it and make your case to see if there's, there's a problem that you're solving or a result that somebody wants, right? Yeah. And to tie it back to our conversation around Mm -hmm. audience. So here's the thing about people is we often will, so we don't like conflict. Most of us are, are not just out here trying to hurt people's feelings. So if someone asks us if we think, if they think, if we think something is a good idea, we're, mm-hmm. we're probably going to say, yeah, or it could be, or, you know. Right. So when you reach out to your audience or you talk to people about your idea, your course idea, chances are you're not going to get great. You're not going to get valuable data. So when you pre-sell, there is no data better than, did somebody buy it? Yes. Okay, cool. You validated that there's a market for that. Your audience wants it. No. Okay, well, on to the next thing. So it just saves you a lot of time and frustration. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you said this, that a lot of people won't hurt your feelings. I was thinking to to myself, (laughs) speak for yourself, Janelle. If you show me something, if you show me something, don't ever show me anything if you don't want to hear the truth. (laughs) Because I will tell you. 
Right. I yeah. would just tell you, it's like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Get out of my face. How's this different than anything else I've seen already? No, I'm just kidding. I try to do that a lot nicer than that, but I will tell you the truth. That's why it's yeah. like some people show me work and they think, oh, here comes a nice pat on the back. And I've learned over the years, I have to ask for permission. What do you want? How can I help you? And yeah. some people are like, oh, can you just comment if that's the right typeface? I'm like, excellent typeface. In my mind, I'm like, that's a total disaster. Everything else sucks. But you asked me if that was a nice typeface, it was. Your use of it was terrible. But, you know, now I ask for permission to do that so I don't offend everybody all the time. Just some of the time. Yeah. Okay, so that's what pre sale <laughs> means. So you're going to validate Right, and you're mm -hmm. gonna see if people actually want it. And this, we've learned this lesson when we were like, "Hey, what T-shirt do you want? You know, or prefer A or B?" And they're like, "Oh, B is amazing." And then when we go and sell it, it's crickets. Mm -hmm. So we sold like yep. 45 shirts instead of like the 600 people who are like, "I want it so bad, take my money." <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you, because you're constantly filtering. I've had mm -hmm. this experience. So people were always saying, I was always getting emails where people were like well, what, do, what should I do? How do I email market? How do I stay consistent? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm going to create a course on email marketing and nobody bought it. But luckily I pre-sold it to, mm -hmm. and no one bought it. So I didn't waste any time. Awesome. We always fall in love with our idea, but it's really right. about are other people in love with your idea? <laughs> that was a case of good news, bad news. The, the bad news is nobody wants you. The good news is you didn't make more effort than you needed to, right? Right. You can move on to the next idea. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, I know I have a couple more questions. I got to get to them, and, and we'll see if uh, anybody on YouTube has a, uh, has a question for you, okay? So let me see. Sure. Let me dig it up here. So we promised at the beginning of the show, how do you differentiate your online course since there are so many? There's so many platforms from Udemy, Skillshare, Creative Live, LinkedIn Learning, mm, Grayscale Gorilla, School of Motion. There's so many. How do you differentiate your online course? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is it doesn't have anything to do with the platform. Oh. Technology is a distraction. That's another, we can okay. go down that rabbit hole. In a <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with your content. Mm -hmm. And so you differentiate by figuring out what, surveying your market, knowing your market, mm -hmm. knowing what's out there and figuring out how you, what you have to offer is different from those. So is it your process? Is it just the way you approach it? Is it your personality? You have to figure out what sets you apart. So that's how you differentiate. Survey your market and then look at how you do things and figure out what you do is different from other people. Okay. Well, I wrote some notes here from your blog, so I'm going to just put them up here. So you also okay. say you need to get specific. You need to niche down and yep. you got to go deep on one topic. Yesterday on Young Guns, it's like, the creative person never wants to go deep on one thing. They love everything all the time. And then you talk about how to um, impact price and perception through social proof. You already talked mm -hmm. about that earlier today. You can do a joint webinar. You can actually leverage other people's audience. And you're just like, it's a little dirty secret. A lot of times these things can be paid for. If you pay another influencer, yeah. they'll talk you up, right? But what's really interesting that you, you said in the, in the article was, it's you, man. You or what makes it unique the yeah, you is there so true. right cuz you can do all of the other things right i can mm -hmm. i can niche down and uh, but if i don't really bring anything like my personality isn't making me stand out and i don't mean being just you know over the top but just what is it about you yeah. that's different well let's take a look at matthew i want to put him on the hot seat right now <laughs> matthew is a mild manner kind of even killed just a super nice guy. How do we find what makes him unique? So one thing that I already know about Matthew mm -hmm. is that he DJed. Yes. That's pretty cool. Mm. So like, what are the things that you do, Matthew, that whatever your, your title is, mm -hmm. let's find you and then find someone else who has that same title. Let's the do this. The things that you're into. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So how can I answer for Matthew? Yeah. You you ask the questions. Let's let's just pretend like he's a client and you're consulting for him, okay? So you said, hey, so it's interesting. You DJ, didn't know that before. He's actually uh, kind of in the hip-hop scene too. So he does b-boying. Is that right, Matthew? Is that how you mm -hmm. describe that? Mm -hmm. And then he also likes mountain or rock climbing. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. also is a very physically fit person. He, he practices practice, uh, mixed martial arts. 
Mm -hmm. And he's also, um, he's classically trained as a graphic designer, has two degrees, one from the Art Institute, one from Art Center. Mm -hmm. And he can also do 3D modeling and animation and visual effects and live action directing. Mm -hmm. And he's Filipino. Mm -hmm. More important. More importantly. <laughs> <laughs> Most important. Okay. Yeah, so now, now what do you do with that? So what I do with that is mm -hmm. I'm going to, so his differentiators are going to be experience. Mm -hmm. It's going to be expertise and it's going to be really just interests and personality that, that mix. So what I do with that is with applied to his work, he's going to bring those, some of those elements to his work. So he's probably, if, if he's going to work with clients who are in the entertainment industry, he's connected because like he's a DJ. And if, mm. if it's a client that has a large audience in the hip hop community, he's mm. going to stand out from somebody else who doesn't know anything about the hip hop community. Mm. So always play to your strengths, your interests, your experience, your expertise always are going to differentiate you. Mm. It's, she's giving me some insight right now, Matthew. I don't know if any light bulbs are going off in your head because Matthew has authored a couple of courses and sometimes he'll teach with me. And here's, here's my observation, maybe totally unfounded, totally untrue. Here's what I think. I think sometimes we have an image in our head as to what somebody that's doing that thing that we want to do looks and sounds like. Mm -hmm. And then we try to emulate them. So as a student, I was inspired by certain instructors who were very good with the command of their words and, and their body language and how charismatic they were. And I tried to be like that. So now I'm wondering, Matthew, since Janelle's brought this up, it, when you're teaching, I don't see the hip hop person. I don't see the DJ. I don't see the rock climber. I don't see the martial artist. Mm -hmm. I just see the guy who's trying to be like very, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but like professorial. Mm -hmm. Like he's trying to teach and he's very serious about it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Me or Janelle? You, Matthew. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just want to provide value and cut the crap. <laughs> yeah. for, for me, it's just, no, it's like if I, if I have a minute of your time, I'm mm -hmm. trying to fill that with value and less about me. So that's my perception when I look at how mm -hmm. I teach. Mm -hmm. It's like, how can I teach this and break this down in the most simplest way that's fluff free? Yeah. And that's also another differentiator. You get straight to the point. I am. That's one of the things that I have as well. And, and my audience has told me they love that. I don't I don't sugarcoat. I don't sell like the myths get straight to the point. But all of that other stuff. Yeah. Different you differentiates you as well. So would you encourage him to try to mix a sprinkling of some of the other stuff that makes him him and not just cut it off? Because Matthew, if you're so efficient at cutting all the other fluff or the BS out, then you're just left with facts or knowledge mm -hmm. and we want to we want it to come from your voice and from your very unique point of view maybe <laughs> i don't know it's, like it's so hard. i empathize with you matthew <laughs> <laughs> because i find that i have to split or i feel like i have to split like my dj personality mm -hmm. and all of that stuff mm -hmm. like i'm going to an event tonight and i'm going to be dressed completely differently i'm going to be you know versus but I'm trying to reconcile and bring some aspects. Like I shared a, a video of an event I DJed and my Zen Courses audience loved it. Mm. I was like, okay. Oh. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So, so I think what I heard there and maybe ways that I can incorporate this is to use this as storytelling points or ways to uncover something about myself. So if there's something relevant that has happened in my life, uh, either personally or an, an experience and it's relevant to what I'm teaching, that might be ways that I could incorporate that into my POV and why this information is relevant to you because here's what I learned and here's what I don't want you to do or here, learn from my mistakes type of thing. Yeah, I think the last thing I'll say on this is what we know, especially in this age of social media, is people are starving for connection. We're, we're automatically drawn in when we feel like we're talking to someone who is a real person, who is imperfect, oh. who has interests. And what I realized this year is that we don't need to create this sanitized version of ourselves. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we throw professionalism out of the window, mm -hmm. but it's okay to create, a, a, have a wide angle of who we are, because that's going to allow people to connect and trust us more. I like that. Jonah, is that why people connect with me? Because I'm so relatable and imp or imp imperfect, Jonah? 
Chris, that <laughs> yes? is indeed <laughs> He's putting on his radio voice. Did you just hear that? Oh, that oh my. So yes, funny. indeed. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, this is a little off topic, but I see this question. I was thinking about this as well. Devad Sanders asks, does your Janelle's background in education and African-American studies, creative writing, or French influence the work that you do in an instructional design? <laughs> Yeah. So talking, this actually connects to what we were just talking about. I used to not not say or or tell people that African American studies was one of my minors mm -hmm. because I felt like maybe it would be divisive, but it does because you know what one of my mission is to democratize education. And Chris, you know, when we had our interview, we kind of talked about uh, access yes. globally, mm -hmm. and that is very important to me. I want to make sure that I'm able to help change lives, not just, you know, in the US where many of us have a lot of privilege, but how can I help more people? And I'm still figuring it out. I don't have all the answers, but that does influence French, eh, not so much. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mio Drag, uh, I don't know how to say this in Via Jovic, says, Hey, Matt, uh, Matthew, I actually had an, a nice opinion of you, but now I like you even more knowing <laughs> this about you, Matthew. I, I'm actually finishing the edit on my introduction video for all of these <laughs> personality things. So we'll release it and we'll see how everybody reacts. We'll see, to that. we'll see, right? All Matthew's of this gonna... information that we just talked about, it's yes. all in there, Chris, just because I'm okay. very aware of what you're, you're telling me. So we'll see how that goes. Matthew's going to let the genie out of the bottle. <laughs> That's right. I mean, <laughs> all because the things you didn't know about me. Right. Well, the, one of the things I talk about quite often, and I think, Janelle, we're saying the same thing because you were saying all of your uh, strengths, interests, background, all that makes you you really unique, and the more that you can incorporate that, that makes sense to what it is you're trying to do, will make you more likable. And I like this idea that you're, you're saying that people are yearning to connect with real people, that have a yeah. point of view, and maybe whatever it is, like, I get really excited, and I don't even try to hide it. And people are like, oh my God, he's going total fanboy. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, then that's okay. Or if I'm angry, I just like let people know I'm angry right now, and it's okay. Despite yeah. my robot personality that I, play on TV. Okay, let's keep going. All right. Here's another question for you, or just a comment. And then maybe you can expand on this. You said it's hard to define knowledge or knowing or something like that. So a better way to understand is learning equals change, learning equals change. And here's a great quote from Leo Buscaglia. I hope I, I said that right. Change is the end result of all true learning. Mm -hmm. Can you give us more of this, please? Yeah, so learning doesn't occur unless there's transformation. Mm. And so that's really what what is meant in that statement when we talk about change. We're talking about transformation. How am I getting you? So one of the things that I teach uh, the people in my group program is to keep the learner's journey in mind. How am I getting you from where you are to where you want to be? I like that. So that is really what what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't if I don't help you affect change or a transformation, then you haven't learned. So it's taking you from where you are and where you want to go. So you're helping them to build that educational bridge that's going to get them there. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think if I read it correctly on your site, you were talking about a lot of times people try to start a learning course by saying, what problem do you have? And I'm going to try to, re to solve that for you. But you're saying like maybe a different way of looking at it is what results are you trying to attain? Did I understand that correctly? Yep. So there's a lot of people who talk about this. I, um, I forgot the, the story brand guy or the brand story guy. And he talked about this. He says a lot of times people mistake and they try to solve the pr wrong problem. That people are motivated. They're, that they're, they're, run, they're not running away from a problem. They're running to a solution. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Donald Miller. Donald Miller. Thank you very much. I think he said that. I just mix everything up. Right. So they're yeah. running to a solution. So where where do they want to go and get them there? Get exactly. them there. OK. Here's another one that um, that you talk about is why do people get stuck in that infinite research stage? And you talk about like habits equals kryptonite to change. I love that. When I read that, I'm like, mm. and I'm going to finish off. This is the trifecta. You pulled out Bruce Lee. Yeah. Everybody loves Bruce Lee. So if you spend too much time thinking about a thing, you'll never get it Ooh. done. See, I, I knew it. See, as soon as you bring up Bruce Lee, <laughs> I get the sound effects from the boys. All right. There you go. Yeah. I teed it up for you. So, I mean, so habits is something I've been obsessed with 
learning more about this year because I got to a point so you know, business is all about solving problems. So I got to a point where I realized I am teaching people how to create a course and yet they're still not all doing the work. What, and it was driving me crazy because I'm very action oriented and I'm very just, just do the, do the work. And I realized that it was habits. Ultimately, Charles Duhigg in his book, The Power of Habit, he says that 40% of the decisions we make on a daily basis, 40 to 45% are actually habits. We think we're making decisions, but we're Mm -hmm. just doing things that we always do. Mm. And so when you put that in the context of learning, it's important to assess what habits do I have that are going to keep me from achieving my goals? So for example, if I say I want to create an online course, But then when it comes time to sit down and do the work, I am on Facebook or I keep putting it off. I keep procrastinating or I get right until it's time to launch and I just kind of decide, "Ah, I'm going to do something else. Those are all habits that we need to identify. So it's super key to be able to make that assessment and then begin to work on transforming or changing those habits so that you can have success. Mm. Did you say 44%? 40 40 to 45%. Okay. It's like so precise. 40 to 45% (laughs) (laughs) are just habits, right? I'm taking notes here because I have to do the show summary recap. Matthew, why don't we finish it off with one more question from our YouTube audience? Okay. Let me select the best one. Uh, Give me a second. Okay. Because there's a few. I think a lot of them have been answered. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Janelle, I'm hoping that if you enjoyed this episode and if our audience likes this, I would love to continue this dialogue with you because obviously we're very much interested, invested in trying to be better better instructors to try and teach the world. That's our mission. So our missions obviously overlap quite a bit. I think I can learn a lot from you and I would just like to continue this dialogue if our audience likes this. So guys, if you enjoy this episode, go ahead and Make a comment. Let us know what you think. Would you like to see more? Were there questions that you wanted to ask but we didn't get to or topics that you want us to cover in the future? And uh, and we'll try our best to do it. Yeah. Okay. But so let I, us know. I have a... Yeah. And don't forget to like this video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Zero Alpha Designs. And his question is, uh, how do you validate uh, your students and the retention of what they're learning? Is there any tools that you use or ways to measure that so that you know that what you're teaching is going to be effective for that person since we're talking about transformation? That is a good question, Matthew. That's a great good question. Good one. Yeah, so yeah, I get a chance to geek out. So yes, you learning should be measurable. So if you're, if you're creating a course workshop program and you're telling people that they're gonna learn X and you've set certain outcomes, in order to truly say that they learned, you have to measure. So Mm -hmm. there are some ways to do that and it really comes down to assessment. So you can do certain things, it depends on on what you're teaching, but you can have like, for example, a pre, everybody probably has had this experience in school. You have a pre-test and a post-test or you have a quiz. Those are assessments to see if you have learned. Mm. So for something like design, so a lot of web designers, graphic designers, I know you have a portfolio. Mm-hmm. So that is a way to assess, has, has, have you learned the concepts that were presented? So assessment is the answer to that question. And that can take many forms from quizzes, exams, course projects, portfolios. But yes, there are, those are the ways. And it's something that you absolutely should do because without assessment, you don't know if learning has happened. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I forgot. Yuri asked this question earlier, and I think a lot of people feel this way. How can you do this if you don't have the credentials? Not you, Janelle, obviously you have credentials (laughs) like people like me. People, anybody can. So here's the thing. And Mm -hmm. and I'm glad that that this question came up. I want to encourage you if you have a skill, an area of expertise, if you just are able to do one thing better or well than say the person who is quote unquote behind you, who doesn't know how to do it, then you can teach. It's not about having credentials. I have credentials, sure, but there are plenty of people who are are teaching. It's about delivering value. So it, it honestly, credentials don't matter. 
the best thing you can do is to get started and start sharing value with people. If you know how to do something, help the next person. Yeah. I'd like to chime in on this as well. If you are a Harvard professor, you've learned so much in your life, you're so used to teaching that sometimes it makes it harder for you to teach the beginner. You as the person who is uncredentialed or still learning actually understand the problem better than anybody else. Janelle talked about this earlier and she said, know your audience. Well, you don't have to know your audience and through research, you just look in the mirror and it's like, what kind of problems have I just figured out? What am I going through? And you could solve those problems much easier. It's something I struggle with a lot. And my wife gives me a hard time about this because when I'm in class, there's a conceptual problem we're trying to solve in one of our communication design projects and they're struggling through with it. And I'm like, the answer is so obvious. It's right there. Like, just do this. And then the students look at me like, oh my God, it was, it was obvious. And my wife said, it's not obvious to anybody but you. We're all staring at it. We don't yeah. see it. You jerk. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, it's so easy. So that's where I forget. And then I, I'm short on patience, a little edgy on that kind of stuff. So if you're just trying to, to, if you're still kind of in the learning process in an earlier part of your career, guys, don't get discouraged. If you identify your process, if you figure something out, you can teach that. So then instead of teaching something really big, teach something small. Create that little tiny product that Janelle talked about and get it out there. Yeah. Validate that, pre-sell that stuff and see if it works. And then you can keep iterating on it. That's another thing I love about online learning courses is you don't have to make it perfect on day one. You can launch, you can sell it, and then you can keep refining it. And everybody that bought it gets the benefit of you updating the operating system or updating the software. Yeah, the last thing I want to say is, and I, I think I'm not a Gary Vee fangirl by any stretch of the imagination, uh -oh. but I think he says <laughs> something. He says, document, don't create. So if you find yourself in a position where you don't feel like you're credentialed enough to teach, mm -hmm. what I would encourage you to do, uh, one example of this is there's a, a designer by the name of Mackenzie Child. And if you Google him on YouTube, you're going to find tons of videos where he was teaching himself how to use Ruby on Rails. And he did that and he just shared his journey. Mm -hmm. He shared mm -hmm. what he was learning. He, sh he did projects that he made up and he built this huge audience just by sharing. So you don't always have to take the position of, I am going to teach you. You can start just by documenting your journey. Mm -hmm. I love that. Right. Okay. And that, she's no Gary Vee fangirl, guys. Right. <laughs> so relax. Oh, no, that's going to go out everywhere. Yeah, it's going to go out. <laughs> That'll be the sound bite that we drop. Right. And you know what I like about that is because you're bringing people on the journey, you're getting to show your personality, right? Your unique POV on why this is important. You're making that small bite-sized content already just by documenting what you're yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, let's say if you spend three months learning this thing, now you know that it's something valuable because what you said earlier is look for problems that people have spent a lot of money or time to solve. So by yep. the end of this, if you're documenting all of this, after three months, you will have your course and you will have all the content and audience built around it. So you could start yeah. from zero starting today if you do all this stuff and you'll have something in three months or six months or whatever it's going to take you to master that little bit of thing that you've set out to do. Yes. Absolutely. Well, it's been fantastic having you on the show. I'm not going to say goodbye to you just yet. I have to do the show summary. But I think you guys, we're all kind of running into the space where there's a lot of problems we want to solve and, and we're all connected to, through these platforms. It's a real opportunity, I think, to share what you know with the world and make a little coin on that. And as Mr. Aaron Draplin would say, make a healthy profit on it as well. Okay, so here goes the summary of the show. Hopefully I got this right. Here we go, Jonah. Here we go, the summary. Start with your audience. Who are they? What results do they want? Validate your course, okay? Define the goal of your course. What should they achieve upon completion of the course? You should know the end result. Work backwards then to create your outline. And if, if, a lot of people get stuck at the beginning because they're unclear about who you are creating for. And they also get stuck with doing the work the outline and the transitioning part and you you suffer paralysis by analysis you got to just get it done and let go of perfectionism okay you also need to realize this it's not easy doing this to teach somebody something is not easy it's going to take time and be dedicated and committed to the work it's going to take you months it's not going to be a couple hours of work how do you build an audience when you don't have one? Well, you partner with others. You do joint webinars. You leverage the audience. You can pay them to shout you out or recommend your course. You can also run ad campaigns and promotions on Facebook and any other outlet that you have. You can also reach out to existing clients who couldn't afford you 
and create a course for them and teach it to them. That allowed us to think about this as having multiple options to your creative service. So even if you're not really truly interested in becoming an online education person, you can also create this as a part of your price decoy as an anchor on the low end is a DIY thing. Then it makes the custom solution look that much more valuable to your client. Okay. Don't jump. These are, uh, these are some advice mistakes to avoid. Don't jump to creating a course. Create a service first. You'll learn more. Mm -hmm. Document your process. Grow your client base and your audience. If you're a consultant and or freelancer, don't get stuck with perfectionism. This is the killer of all creativity. Okay, our idealized version of what it is we're going to create. Just get something done, and don't overbuild. Tiny products. That's what you want to think. Small, small products, and iterate. You want to connect with your audience, outline the course, and then you can pre-launch. Whew! I got a couple more pages here. The reason why you pre-sell is because you want to validate your course to see if people will buy it before you create it. The kind of whole Kickstarter mentality. And people are starving to make meaningful, real connections with you. So don't sanitize yourself for your, for whatever belief that you might have. And we also have to realize a lot of the resistance to change is really driven by habit, which we think are just our free will and decisions that we're making. So we've got to examine our habits because your habits are the kryptonite to change. Uh, okay, learning is about transformation and you can measure this through assessment and you're ultimately providing to your audience tools to go from here to there. And lastly, no fangirl. Document, don't create. That's from Gary Vaynerchuk. And before we say goodbye, I want to thank everybody for watching to the very end of this and especially our guests Janelle, Matthew, and Jonah for bringing it always their A-game and to our sustaining members. If you guys want to get in touch with Janelle, you can reach out at Janelle Allen. She's on Twitter. You can also go to her website, which is zencourses.co. Not .com, .co. Zencourses.co. Janelle, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah. me. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the room There's all the time. Of you guys, come down, come down. <laughs> yeah. Before okay. we go, I just wanted to say two things. Obviously, thank you, Janelle. You've been fantastic on here. Everybody was saying how much they love you and mm. they love your personality and just the way you speak. Uh, definitely refreshing because you're educated compared to the rest of us chumps <laughs> over here. Wow. But I also <laughs> wanted to try to design a logo. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll all stay in our lanes. Uh, I just wanted to shout out to Ed Reyes, who, who also donated in the super chat. He had a question. Ed, if you could put that in the comments below, maybe Janelle can come back and answer that for you. And then I also want to uh, shout out Stephanie. Yes, yeah, Stephanie! Stephanie Stewart, she donated $25. Fantastic. She said, I so appreciate this. I can't go to big design school. And what I've learned in the past month between the webinars and the design bundle have been so informing so she's been asking a lot of questions that we've been answering there so that's been fantastic Yay! and then the last thing i wanted to say before we do our outro <laughs> speaking of uh validating and uh yes. you know getting that kickstarter mentality we have just launched a Kickstarter. Oh, Pocket Matthew, I didn't dough. realize this. <laughs> I, I just dropped this in the chat so okay. you guys can take a look. Check it out, people. <laughs> Kit, uh, Chris is launching his very first book on Kickstarter called Pocket Full of Dough. I put the link in there. We'll put that in the description so we can validate to see if people actually value Chris's thoughts or <laughs> no, if, they don't. <laughs> if they're not going to spend money on this thing. So, All right. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to get out of here. Have a great day. See you guys on the next live stream.